Good morning. Good morning, and I want to welcome particularly the shapers here among us. The shapers have made a great contribution to the program when I developed the idea to integrate a new uh, provocative uh, voice for the future here in the annual meeting. Uh, there were quite some skeptics, and there was also some pushback. Uh, here, uh, at least the media believe in Davos is only um, the rich and the powerful. Um, we had, of course, many other communities before, like the social entrepreneurs, the NGOs, the faith leaders, and so on. Uh, so we had already uh, quite some provocative uh, dimension in the sessions, but you made it even more provocative. So thank you. It's very important to, to, to have your voice. It's also, in my opinion, one of the biggest uh, challenges which we have in the world, uh, the intergenerational conflict. We have a tendency to solve our issues uh, mainly on the back of the young generation. Just let's look at the debt. I mean, we, we talk about debt in technical terms, deleveraging and so on, but actually uh, we should talk about that much more in intergenerational terms because the more debt we pile up, the more, the more we commit sins towards the next generation. As simple as that. So, we have a quite, uh, uh, I would have liked to take all you here, um, all our nearly 100 shapers on the, on the stage, technically impossible. So, um, uh, David has chosen four. Um, and let me first ask you, and I go, uh, let's say, one by one, instead of introducing you, why don't you introduce yourself? One minute, very shortly. Um, uh, first, what uh, your name, what you're doing, and why you feel, in one sentence, you are a global shaper. Because don't, let's not forget, global shaper is a commitment. It means that you have made the commitment not only, not only to uh, to work for your own personal interests, but to make a contribution to the world. Why don't you start? Thank you, Mr. Schwab. Um, my name is Manju George, and I, I'm co I've co-founded a company in India called IntelliCap, which channels equity capital to social entrepreneurs, also gives them platforms to uh, talk to investors, grow their business. Um, why do you, I think uh, I'm a global shaper? Because I think um, I feel very deeply about some of the issues that are being raised uh, here in the World Economic Forum around social equity, uh, sustainability, etc. And I've already taken a step um, towards trying to play a part in addressing those. Uh, I'm Tyler Spencer. I'm from Washington, D.C. And I run an HIV AIDS prevention education program for youth in southeast Washington, D.C. Um, also very interested in the evaluation of complex social programs and how NGOs can communicate the results to other stakeholders. Um, I am a global shaper because I believe that young people will solve many of the world's problems and being a global shaper means having access to other young people like myself, the other 70 here and then hundreds around the world and then also just being able to come to WEF and have the opportunity to learn from um, some of the other uh, older leaders um, who have had a lot more experience and are, are working at a much higher level. Um, good afternoon, everyone. My name is Rapalang Rabana. I'm in, from Cape Town in South Africa. I'm an internet and technology entrepreneur there. I'm essentially building services that enable businesses to compete better, supporting services such as telecommunications. Um, my main mission, and I think the reason I'm a global shaper, is that I genuinely believe in the power of mobile and the internet and technology to provide solutions that are going to be scalable enough to impact the millions of people in Africa that need to feel the impact. Um, and being part of this community gives me a great platform and leverage point to actually begin to discuss how those solutions might look like. I'm Neil Bowerman. I'm a climate scientist at Oxford University. And uh, on the side, I also run, help to run Giving What We Can, which is uh, a donor organization where to become a member, you have to pledge to donate 10% of your income for the rest of your life. 
and we uh, give this money on to the most cost-effective charities. Um, I first came into this idea of uh, making a difference in the world and helping others uh, when I was uh, 11 years old, and I was seeing uh, my friends' parents driving them into school, and yet our, our road had the highest levels of uh, air pollution in the whole of the UK. And I thought this was a huge disconnect. And I talked with my friends about it and realized that sometimes young people have solutions that older people don't. Sometimes young people are affected by things that older people don't have. And so we set up a carpooling system. Uh, and from then, it's just kept going. Let me, well, let me ask you from your conversations now, uh, during the annual meeting, uh, you have heard and you have been part of uh, many discussions uh, what are the long-term issues that leaders across generations need to address collectively now? The so long-term issues, the issues which will shape your lives. What are those issues? Let, let me again, let's, let's start on this and I, why don't you start then? Sure. So I'm a climate scientist and my PhD is on uh, emission targets for solving dangerous climate change. Every day I look at data that suggests that my future is going to be challenging in 50 years' time. Uh, it suggests that if we don't tackle these problems now, uh, the, our entire generation is going to have a huge issue on its hands in 50 years' time in, uh, in the name of climate change. Um, and so I see this as one of the biggest problems. There are really simple things that we can do here today. Um, uh, and uh, in, when we go home with our governments and with our companies, Simple things like ending subsidies to fossil fuels. Why are we paying people to use up precious resources that damage our environment? Uh, for me, the person who's going to have to reap the consequences of those decisions, it doesn't make sense. Please. Right. Um, the key issues that I, I, I believe need to be addressed, especially in developing markets, is the delivery um, of critical services such as education and health. Um, financial services, farming support, and the role of mobile and internet in delivering those services or improving them or facilitating them is, is immensely crucial. We've seen a couple of examples in the forum already where independent developers and companies are using the mobile phone and internet services to try and solve critical problems. Um, for example, in Africa, we have a company called Afros that develops games that enable children to understand issues around sexual abuse and gives them tools to actually report some of the issues happening around them. And there's numerous of those. And in order for these solutions to get across to the billions of people and not just the two billion that have access, we've got to find a way to reach the other five billion. We've got to start looking at key issues around how that access happens? Um, do, we, do we enable governments or support governments in allocating the spectrum needed to deliver internet broadband access in all of those countries? How do we drive down the cost of devices? How do we drive down the cost of bandwidth for the individual person who will access it? Shouldn't we be talking about things like bandwidth aid and bandwidth charity instead of food and grains? How else, how, what else can we do to ensure that, that this access is actually penetrated to the deepest levels? Uh, for me, I think leadership is going to be a big issue um, as we cross generations and especially talk about transforming um, new models for the world. Uh, it's been pretty obvious, I think, in the last year that uh, young people now more than ever have the capacity to, change, to, to make change politically, um, to start uh, amazing social enterprises and businesses. You look at Mark Zuckerberg started Facebook in his, in his teens or his 20s. You look at some of the global shapers yesterday who have started um, amazing education reform enterprises. And I think our assets, we have amazing assets in that we're so connected to each other and we're not, we don't necessarily need hierarchies to share information with each other. With each other. Um, we're incredibly passionate and we're not scared to fail. We're very willing to innovate. Um, and then you look at the top level and I think um, I've, I've heard a lot of conversation in the last couple of days about uh, big companies who are interested in, in having representation of young people on their boards and the decisions that they make. Uh, and I think it's very important that uh, we collaborate as we move forward to figure out how the assets that we have can complement the assets that older, the older generation has in terms of leadership and knowledge and experience. Anju? So for me, the big uh, issues are social equity and sustainability and the role of the business in, 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 in sort of achieving that. Um, I'm a strong believer of um, uh, business and the power it has. I believe it should create financial value to move us forward as, as a community. But I don't believe it should be done at any cost. Um, and I, I think 
um, we also need to incorporate other considerations such as, um, you know, do we, are we creating jobs? Are we stimulating SME activity? Um, are we tr doing enough to reduce income disparities uh, across countries, across communities? Um, and I also see a lot of that happening uh, already in the forum. For instance, we have the social entrepreneur community uh, at the forum uh, who, to my mind, are already leading the way in, in trying to uh, trying to blend business uh, considerations, financial considerations, as well as looking at the society and the environment at the core of how they design business models. And I think I would like to see more of that coming from the big businesses because social entrepreneurs, the limit, the, the, there are limitations to how much they can reach, uh, you know, given, given the current resources they have access to. Um, so I think if I can see the large businesses uh, joining that uh, sort of movement, I think that's something which I would be very happy about at the long term. Professor Yunus, you, you are the father of uh, social entrepreneurs, if I may say so. Um, and listening to those four um, shapers, uh, we have seen they are all in maybe not what we usually call, uh, they are not usual social entrepreneurs, but they all have created enterprises with a social purpose. That's how I would um, uh, define it. Um, how do you see at the moment, let's say, the necessity to combine economic objectives with social objectives? And uh, even if we look at the, at the panel which was here before, uh, we have seen some of the panelists uh, emphasizing uh, the social um, let's say emphasizing what was always at the core of the World Economic Forum, entrepreneurship. You mentioned you feel strongly about markets, uh, competitiveness, um, uh, but always serving uh, society. Uh, how do you see this whole movement? Okay. Well, uh, I should introduce myself as a cheerleader of the shapers. So this, that's my job. That's my job. <laughs> Uh, first, is to say, uh, one of the things that uh, this is a part of an exercise, the question that you raised, is about uh, probably visioning, uh, about the net, uh, kind of system visioning. And this is one part is missing in our di discussion. That's why we have to have a separate session with them. It should be integrated in the whole thing, and we should need to spend a lot more time envisioning about the future, what kind of society we want then we can work backward to see how do we get there. Today, I don't think we have a vision. We are just kind of floating um, uh, minute by minute, and if some, some disturbance like the Eurozone disturbance or um, uh, financial disturbance, we get very worried about those kind of things. And we forget uh, why, what is this worry about? What, what, what is that we will be missing out in future? What is the thing which will be disturbed by that? Unless we do the vision, unless we know the destination, uh, we'll be condemned to get lost. So for me, we are lost. We don't know what we want because the, you, we are highlighting, focusing the uh, shapers. Uh, they, are, they are exceptions. They are not the norm because the economic uh, structure doesn't allow them to function. Sooner or later, they'll be gulped in. They will be uh, brought into the money making because money making is the mission of the entire thing we do, which I think is the wrong orientation, because uh, today uh, money has become the king, and it has been uh, uh, become an, an intoxication almost in the structure. In that atmosphere, to ask the uh, social entrepreneurs to do exceptional thing, it needs a lot of hard work uh, to make it happen. So why don't we make it convenient that if you want the social objectives, it should be integrated in the structure itself, not as an afterthought. These are afterthoughts. Uh, and that's what we should be aiming at. That should be, we should be visioning the structure should deliver us this so that we can continually do both. And not only we make money, at the same time, uh, we change the world in the direction that you're looking for. Not accidentally we do uh, uh, good things for the uh, society. It should not be accidental thing. It's a pre-designed thing. So that that pre design can take us to the destination what we have. Mohammed, uh, you couldn't speak out more of my heart. Thank you. Because <laughs> since uh, 42 years, the motto of the World Economic Forum, which is an economic forum, sure 
is committed to improving the state of the world. Also in the opening session, I said we have a visions gap and we have a values okay. gap. It's very clear uh, that the world um, confronted with such a complexity of challenges at the moment is so much absorbed with crisis management that we do not have any more the time to think about the long term. And probably we act in a way which uh, um, is, I would say, disassociated from a value system which we all share. Now let me ask the young generation. Yeah. If you look, and I take up the two issues, vision and um, values, what is actually your vision for the future? Anybody, I mean, it, it's, it's very clear and very easy to say we, we lack visions. Uh, but what, what is your vision for the future? If, if you had to define the headline describing the world in 20 years from now, how would it look like? I see <laughs> you, you are eager to speak out. Um, my wish is that um, the way the world functions fundamentally changes. We're currently outside of po political unrest or social unrest. The only people who are capable of effecting significant change is a privileged minority at the top. And I envision a world where the notion that um, a select group of people can cater for the needs of a majority of people who are not participating in the process is reversed. And through giving them access to information in mobile or internet and the like, more people can be active contributors of their own destiny, of their own economy, of their own world. And essentially a higher value or capacity for self-determination in their own world. Anybody to contribute of the young generation, of the shapers? Mm. Yeah, I think yeah, it's about it's about having a long-term vision. You said in 20 years' time. I want to take it further. I want to go out to 2050, 2080, and I want to build a society that's going to last that long um, and last through the century. Um, uh, James James Martin, uh, who's a professor at Oxford uh, and has funded a lot of our institutions, has said that we have a one in two chance of surviving through to the end of this century. Um, personally, I'm more hopeful than that. But I think we need to start addressing some of these systemic issues, whether it's um, making sure we have a, a long-term sustainable financial, crisis, uh, financial system or having um, voting systems that everyone can get involved in um, and having interconnected uh, participants in our democracy. Um, these are the kinds of issues that are going to get us through this century um, and are going to leave us with a world in 2050, 2100 that we all really want to live in, that we can proudly say, I helped create this. Um, and not the kind of hodgepodge, add a bit here, add a bit there, kind of almost like slum dwelling that, that the world is heading towards at the moment, but a really kind of articulated plan for where we're going and how we get there. Yes? I think I would also like to see a much more um, collaborative world, uh, one where you know, the young, the old, the private sector, the public sector, we all work together towards achieving some of the, the, the vision that uh, Raplan uh, articulated. <laughs> Um, so I think that, that's something which I would look forward to. So it's, would you? I, was, I mean, I was just going to add for me, it's, it's pretty plain and simple. I think a world in which everyone has equal opportunity, and that doesn't mean, um, that means that the bottom billion have the same chances as everyone else to get an education, to um, get a job, um, all of the above. And I think part of that is, um, like Maji said, is, is, is being able to collaborate. And as you mentioned, I think values is one of the most important discussions um, that we've had in the last four days here, and it's incredibly difficult. I think in order to realize that vision of the world, um, we will have to, do, to agree on some set of shared values. When you, I, I come back to the shared values, but when you speak about the collaborative world, which means we are not alone, we have a collective objective. Would you um, share the, the premise that actually such a world can only be built if you prioritize the uh, collectivity over your own individual um, egoistic objectives? So it's always you serve, I would put it in the following way, you have to serve society. That has to be the basic premise. Otherwise, uh, collaboration 
uh, is meaningless. Would you, would you like to comment on that? I provoke you. Um, I don't think that the two are opposites. Uh, personally, uh, me and my ego and myself get a whole lot of pleasure out of helping other people. Um, we were discussing in the dinner on intelligence um, on Friday night that uh, we have evolved as a society in small communities where if you help a friend, they will help you back. Um, now we live on this global scale where we can help each other and in return get things back. And the beauty of this is that through these, uh, what seem at first like random acts of kindness, um, helping something here, doing something there, we end up with everyone coming together and building things like Wikipedia. I have no little, I have little personal interest in contributing to Wikipedia. It gives me a thrill though to know that I'm helping people all over the world to learn things. And yet together we build these cathedrals of the 20th, 21st century um, through this collaborative action. So I don't think they're necessarily separate. Any other comment? Um, I, I would strongly agree. And um, something which I noticed in the last three to four days that I've spent here um, is that while we are talking about the same set of issues, often the perspectives are very um, narrow. So if, if, if you're a businessman, then you're talking about your immediate short-term sort of issues. If you are a social entrepreneur, you're talking about you know, social issues. Um, I, what I see lacking is a common language um, and an ability to really, really talk about issues and really move towards action. And I think there I would also want to touch briefly upon the issue of leadership because I think uh, what we need is somebody who's able to convene these multiple uh, segments and communities and, um, and really help you know, show them that vision that uh, Professor Yunus talked about and really convince them to move forward in, in, in the same direction. Let me come back to the issue of values. If you had to define your values with three key words, what would those three key words be? Be open. Equity would be one for me. Yeah, and what, equity? Empowerment. Empowerment. Interconnectivity. Interconnectivity? I think I'm going to say, can I have three words? <laughs> I think I'm going to say respect, honesty, and authenticity. Yeah. Any, anything you would add? No. Yeah. Um, I also really value uh, intergenerational equity. So two types of equity, both across the people alive today, but through generations as well. Yes, but you could, you could also extend it and say uh, gender. Mm, uh, you definitely. could integrate, and I mean, there are so many, so many um, ways uh, to create harmony in diversity. Um, let me come back to another issue. You came here now to Davos, you were integrated into a global society, global event. But where is your identity? Is your identity first a global identity? a national identity or a local identity? If you, were, if you had to prioritize those so three identities of your personality and of your thinking, how would you prioritize them? It's global for me, and I think it's... Global for uh, you? Yeah, yeah. And? Uh, we had to do a lot of thinking about this question uh, when we set up uh, our charity, and we decided that we value all people's lives equally right the way across the world. So for me, it's definitely a global... We probably had a big debate about this, in fact, between the African countries in terms of what does it mean to be African as well today. So there's definitely a greater sense that it's a much more connected space. And I definitely consider myself as being global because um, the problems or the solutions to the problems that we conceive now generally can't be applied to a local space. They should be scalable across regions and across countries. So I would think in the bigger picture of a global landscape. I think I identify myself as local, um, operating mainly in Washington, D.C., but also have the amazing opportunity of, of working in Washington, D.C., where you're also the hub of Washington the Washington is very local, I, I so know. My, so my work, my work is very focused on specific neighborhoods in Washington, D.C., and I think the vision of my organization is that hopefully we'll be able to scale this up into other places. But at the, at the moment, I'm very locally focused. However, also have the opportunity to, you know, go to the White House and attend meetings and hear about how the same issues I address in our backyard um, are, ha you know, how they're manifest in other places around but the world. But your own identity, not now related to your work. Do you think first in global dimensions? Global. 
global. Okay. So. I think that's one of the, well, for me, one okay. of the most striking phenomena when you, when you interact with the shapers. Um, we, the, the older generation, still grew up uh, with a clear priority. It was uh, national or, uh, uh, in my case, it was European. Today, the young generation has clearly a global first, a global identity. And that makes me very, ha very uh, hopeful for the future because um, one of the major conflicts in the, in the past were national, um, um, the interference of national priorities, which uh, prevented us uh, from solutions. Um, Professor Jonas. Yeah, I'm just uh, making a general comment. I, I feel that um, kind of uh, looking at the future, the vision that uh, we want to build, uh, should be a continuous process. It's not a uh, suddenly sprung thing that uh, what we want to do. Uh, every year we do that, and it should be part of our growing up from childhood. Uh, what is your vision? What do you want to do 10 years from now, 20 years from now? Uh, what do you want to see yourself? What do you want to see the world to be? Uh, so that we know uh, if we vision, then gradually we'll move towards that. We don't have that exercise in our schools, in our education system. Uh, all say, I want to be a great guy, a celebrity like him. That's all. We are not visioning as a life, as a world, as together. Uh, today's technology allows all these, uh, many of the values that we are talking about, to discover themselves and put into practice. Uh, because if I'm uh, from country A or country B, uh, the, the today's Facebook and today's Twitters and today's all the remove those things because I have so many friends, so, so many places. We are so close to each other. So the visioning is something which w would be an integral part of the education system where in the education system we are emphasizing how to move on so that I can get the best education and get the best job and uh, work hard so that my company makes a lot of money. Uh, that's the only vision I have. There's nothing other. Which I don't see a global entity as somebody that we, here we want to go together. So that togetherness is missing from our visioning practices. We, in our businesses, we don't have this visioning practice. We're always showing how much growth we have done, how much money we have made. Uh, the, the collective visioning that this is the planet that we want to move together, and within this period of time, say 20 years from now, this is where we will collectively want to reach it. Nobody is imposing that. It's not a government order or anything. It's our own wish as a human being on this planet. This is what we want to do. We need to do that visioning. Then the young people will say, what is my vision? I don't agree with Professor Yunus's vision. I don't agree with Klaus Schwab's vision. It's my vision and I want to work for it. Each one should have their own vision, what the kind of world they would like to create. These are all creators of the world. They know that. But the, we are not, in our system, we don't allow them to think that way. We are only following what our elders have done, how we do it better than they did. I think that's not a good way to proceed forward. Um, <laughs> Professor Yunus, I, I would argue I think we make uh, matters too simplified if we say we have to change the system. In my opinion, we have to adapt the system to the necessities of today, or I would say even um, much more rigorously, the necessities of tomorrow. Um, I, I wrote several uh, editorials before uh, this meeting and I argued for the reform of capitalism. We have to make capitalism or the free market again much more responsive uh, to social needs and we have to be much more aware of our social responsibility. And I feel during this meeting, um, I talk to many business leaders who are completely aware of this necessity. Look at the people who were here on the stage before. Um, if I look at the 50 initiatives which we have in the forum, which have all a social purpose, I'm not defending the forum. I'm, I'm, uh, what I'm uh, arguing is that there is a change happening. And I think there is a greater awareness. People have understood uh, that if at the end business is not serving society, the system is not uh, sustainable. 
But there is no, there is no alternative system. We have to reform the present system. Now let's see with the young generation. Uh, quick, Let, let's not make a dispute now yeah, between us. <laughs> let's, let's, we are here to listen to the young generation. Let's, what is your opinion? I think the question of adaptation versus a complete change is a tricky one and it comes down to timing. If the system doesn't adapt quickly enough, then we end up in situations where what we saw with the Arab Spring or entire governments and political systems collapsing. So it really comes down to how quickly those small adaptations can be done and felt by the general person on the street. Because if it doesn't, then it does ultimately result in an overall change when people become too frustrated. Then the question of where that line is and how much time you have is a very tricky one to balance. Any other comment? Um, I wanted to respond uh, to Mohammed's uh, previous point about, about visioning real quick and kind of when you're visioning the system you want to build. Um, and it's an exercise that I'd, I'd recommend all of, you, all of you try out. So every single month uh, I sit down and have a look at my vision for the rest of my life and my plans for the next month um, and, then, and really think about kind of how that's going to fit in with the broader vision. Um, and then every year, I, get, I sit down with a bunch of friends, and we go over and we kind of collectively check that our visions are, are working together, and, and we can collaborate and, and help each other on this. And so when you're thinking about the systems you want to design, and, uh, and, uh, and kind of alternatives or uh, adaptations of them, um, I'd, I'd really recommend that you guys give this a go. Um, just once a month, kind of writing down your vision for, for, for the rest of your life and reviewing it, and then once a year, getting together with some people and checking them out. Can you? I, I think for me, the, the problem is that we haven't found that common language. We all feel the need to change, but uh, the, the, we don't feel about it the same way, feel the need uh, the same way. So I think, again, I, I come back to leadership because I, I want um, somebody who sort of shows the way um, and is able to bring in people with very different languages together. That, that for me, is missing. Mm -hmm. Let me, let me, we will not solve this issue, I mean, so, but let me change the subject for a moment. Um, you have lived now for one week in, in, in Davos, you have interacted with many people. What was for you the most important Davos moment? Where you had the feeling it had a transformational impact on, on, on your life. Any such Davos moment? Because I have had many reactions from participants who, who told me about the Davos moment. What was your Davos moment? I can tell you my Davos moment first. It was actually with the uh, Global Shapers on Monday when I met you the first time. And you know we have the Global Shapers organized in local hubs. And I entered the room and one of the Global Shapers asked me, from what hub are you? <laughs> so, <laughs> so, so what was your, what was your Davos moment? And it made me great, feeling great the whole week. I, but, but, um, yeah. for, for me, it was again the meeting with the shapers, um, which, and there was this realization that a lot of the issues that I felt dearly about are being shared by people um, from very different parts of the world and that you're not alone in thinking through some of these issues and that you can collaborate with the power of technology and you know, we are much more interconnected, etc. So th that realization was definitely uh, the moment for me. Um, for, uh, I, I came to Davos with a, a kind of a long list of people I wanted to meet, but for me the most valuable moment I had here uh, was when I met um, Sendhill, and I'm not going to try and pronounce his last name, but he's um, one of the a professor of economics at Harvard. And um, we clicked so well that we then sat for the next three hours and um, redesigned uh, huge aspects of my organization based on his latest research. And I would have never thought that he was someone I should talk to. And I would have never had that opportunity to sit down with him and drastically redesign the work we're doing. Um, but for me, that was incredibly valuable. The unforeseen opportunity, which became a reality here. I think for me, um, I would agree with what Manji said, just being able to meet face-to-face -face a lot of the shapers in here um, about the projects we're doing, the challenges they face. I know that like, I will definitely continue that relationship beyond this. Uh, but also, one of the moments for me actually was in a panel, or it was, it was a dinner panel on leadership. And several of the tables went around and talked about some of the sort of leaders that we, I, that we um, 
you know, really look up to like Nelson Mandela, Mother Teresa, and we kind of teased out different traits that we thought they had in common. And um, the conversation was great, but what really made it was uh, this, I think it was one of the CEOs of a big company stood up and said, you know, we don't look to these people for leadership. We don't look at these traits. Our definition of leadership is completely different from this. And for me, it was really valuable because I think I have quotes taped, off, taped up all around our office of all of the traditional leaders that we always talk about. But it was amazing to be able to be in a room with someone like that who had a completely different opinion and also a very valid one. Um, I think my favorite Davos moment was in one of the ideas labs when um, two of the shapers presented um, their ideas um, in terms of what they're doing in education in the Philippines and in Nigeria and how the level of interest and commitment in the groups that formed thereafter to try and help them develop their products, I mean, their services better and take their services to the next level was just astounding for me to have so many com business leaders actively trying to help each young person try and make the organization a greater success and then to top it off at the end for, for one of these business leaders to make a donation to them directly after this kind of presentation was just astounding. For me, it, it, it crystallized the idea that you can do something and as long as you reach out authentically that there are people who will join your cause and that was very profound for me. One last point. So I attended uh, a dinner uh, session with uh, Paolo Coelho, and one of the things he said is there is natural fear. You are you you know f you're afraid of animals, etc. But uh, you also have a second fear, which is the fear of changing. Um, and when we uh, also had one of the Global Shaper meetings, one of our colleagues said, you know, we, we're afraid of losing power. We are afraid of losing that monopoly to information, etc. And that is what is preventing us from changing. And I don't have an answer to it, but I, 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 that's something which definitely struck me. Let's go a little bit deeper into this notion of leadership, because we use leadership as a rather abstract uh, uh, term. What, what is for you leadership? How would you define leadership? And leadership which you are looking for, not um, leadership, it's good leadership. What is for you leadership? Who wants to give a try? I think leadership for me is um, the role where you facilitate a group or a team of people to ultimately achieve the best result. So it's not about having the result or the solution at the beginning or knowing what the best outcome is, but creating the environment for the best people in your group to ultimately achieve the most cohesive answer. And that's what leadership should be going forward as a more inclusive and collaborative approach that takes in the perspectives and recommendations of others. For me, it's all about culture. Um, I've, I've had the privilege now of working for the first time in an organization where I feel incredibly supported by every single person on our team of directors. And that's a hard culture to, to build. It's, it's, the kind of, it's the kind of place where you can just call up any time, anyone, and ask for any favor, and you know they're going to say yes. Um, and so it's the leader that can build this culture of generosity and bring out the talents in each and every person um, and allow them to flourish in a way that's so, so supportive. Any other? For yes. me, it's um, inspiration and, and wisdom. Uh, I, I believe that, you know, uh, global shapers are all leaders in their own way, but I also think that there is um, a lot to be learned from, you know, the paths we've already taken and the older generation that's um, realized what works and what doesn't work. So for me, that leadership should have that element of wisdom, which helps us as we walk ahead. I mean, I think a leader is, is, is anyone who can get people to do more and do better than they would be able to do on their own. And I want to also add a trait that I think is incredibly important in leadership, and that's transparency. So I think leaders are not always the most popular people, um, but for a leader to be able to always communicate values and strategy to everyone that they're leading is an incredibly important quality. Excellent um, definitions. Professor Yunus, what would be your definition of leadership? <laughs> Well, uh, again, I would say that it's very unkind uh, for us old people, uh, elderly people, and uh, others to impose our ideas on the young people. Uh, I would avoid that uh, and make the, the young people to come up with their own thinking uh, and see what kind of uh, world they would like to build for themselves uh, some, uh, so that we can make a drastic change rather than uh, marginal changes over days because uh, they, we are in a world today in 21st century which is changing so fast. Speed of change is enormous. Every day it's becoming faster and faster. 
if we try to, uh, from uh, another age, try to bring things from that age, uh, we'll slow down that speed. Young people absorb that speed, can change the world so much faster if they have figured out what they want to, where they want to go, how they want to go, what rules they want to formulate, and this is what young people should do. And they are the leaders to take us to the next level of uh, civilization the, from the one that we are coming. We are coming from the civilization. Those who are young people who should be leading us to this world are the ones who are laid out outside, thrown out of the train, uh, unemployed. Uh, that's not a good kind of leadership that we have created for uh, our generation. These are the young people who are left out from the system. They are the ones who have the leadership to change the world. Uh, we, we should find a way how to make them, bring them into their leadership positions. Professor Yunus, uh, I, um, when, I when I integrated the Global Shapers uh, uh, into the forum, I had to, I had to argue 50% uh, of the global population are below 27 years old. But I have to say there are also 50% of the population who are more than 27 years old. So um, leadership means balance between the old and the new generation. But you hint at a very important point. You highlight the, um, the speed. And I come back, it's a speed, it's a complexity, and it's the interconnectivity, which really is changing, is changing our world. And here you have a dilemma. The dilemma is that on the one hand, and I fully agree, leadership has today based on collective power, on social power. So you have to integrate everybody who is affected by a decision into the design of the decision. On the other hand, you are under the pressure to act very fast. So there's a dilemma because very often um, in order to take the decision, it's necessary that it is a collective decision. It needs time. On the other hand, you have to act fast. So how do you bridge this dilemma? And here we come back to values, in my opinion. If people know, if you take a decision, and it may be not based on a collaborative process, because you are in a crisis, or whatever the situation is, you have to act. And you want that people do not only talk about issues, but that they act. If they want to take a collaborative decision, they have to talk about it, they have to have a dialogue, conversation and so on. But there are situations where they have to act. And the only justification, the only legitimization when you act, if you really exercise leadership, is that people know on what, what values your decision is based. You may not be always taking a decision in a collaborative way, but people have to know what was the underlying value system on which the decision was based? Would you agree? Uh, were you asking me? Oh, the first the young. We, uh, first you the you said the young are yeah, deciding. Okay. <laughs> so. Let's do it. Um, uh, I agree with most of that, except I think you can use the power of the internet to have both collaborative and very quick That's action hard. and decisions. Um, we've seen in the Arab Spring, um, even in the UK when uh, a piece of legislation is proposed that, um, that may be potentially detrimental, our, our health care bill. We didn't know whether the government removed the right for universal access to health care from our health care bill. Um, and so we went on the internet um, with uh, 38 degrees and uh, quickly raised um, uh, £100,000 in order to hire a lawyer um, that could look through this. Um, and so it was people all over the UK chipping in money to hire a lawyer to check whether or not our healthcare bill had removed the right of universal access. He came back and said, uh, kind of, we're not really sure you need, to, you need to tell MPs about this and it needs to be made clear in the bill. Um, and so then thousands of people across the UK collaboratively um, went and told their MPs about this. And all of this happened within the space of a few days. Um, so with the power of the internet, you can get these highly collaborative and yet very fast and effective decision-making processes. Any other comment? We have to close uh, the session in five minutes, so I would like to use those five minutes 
to ask each of uh, the panel members and Professor Yunus, when you look at um, the um, world of tomorrow, what is the single most important advice you would give to leaders today if they make decisions they affect your future? Concrete advice. What will affect us? Which is not just, let's say, uh, which uh, is practical, which is practical. We can all talk in very uh, lofty um, uh, terms, uh, but what practical advice would you give to leaders today if they structure the future for your generation? For me, it would be listen. Uh, listen to uh, people who you uh, today probably don't believe you know, can be part of the solution, can be part of shaping tomorrow. Um, so for him, that includes uh, women, young, youth, uh, you know, the disadvantaged, the unserved. Um, listen, I think that that would be... Again, makes the decision integrating as many diverse voices as possible. I think I would echo that and, and just say that I think, you know, unconventional times, unconventional problems call for unconventional leadership. And I think unconventional leadership, and in and, and my opinion, is what we've been talking about this entire panel is collaboration. We've identified that young people can do things like Neil is saying. They do have great access to each other and, and have a, different, a more non-linear form of thinking, whereas you know, it's also a major asset for older leaders with experience to think in that linear way. But what needs to happen is there needs to be more dialogue between these two different sets of leaders if we really want to solve the world's problems. Um, I would say to my um, African leaders that the solutions that we need to come up with to solve access to key services must be scalable to billions of people. And let's not underestimate the power of technology to help that. And it's not that about the internet being a frivolous tool that enables just arrow springs. It's crucial to economic development. Um, in the 1400s, we saw how the printing press increased the dissemination of information and consequently contributed to one of the most exponential increases in global trade. The internet can take that to another unprecedented level. Um, there's a Chinese proverb that talked about the teaching, teaching a man to fish instead of giving him food. And today I want to propose another model that says that teach a man to fish and you will feed him for a lifetime, but expose him to the internet and he will change his life. Great. Um, I'd do two things. First, I'd ask, a quest I'd ask a question, and second, a concrete solution. So the, the question, which I'll also ask to all of you is, how old will you be in 2050? Take a moment to think about that. Um, I found this guides a lot, of, a lot of my thinking on the issue. I'll be 64. I'll have, I'll have a world to live in that looks very different from the one today. And so as part of creating that world that I, that I really want to live in, um, I think we need to set up a commission for future generations um, in governments around the world. Hungary has taken the first step and has set up a, a, a commission for future generations. Um, that all of their bills have to go through to check that they don't adversely affect people who aren't alive today. Um, and I think this is a model that should be rolled out across the world. Professor Yunus? Uh, my advice will be don't be roadblocks. Allow the things to change because uh, the, the younger generation have the power to create the future of 2035 or 2030, uh, whatever that future is, uh, much better, much faster. Encourage them to take that lead rather than uh, uh, create problems in, in taking that leadership role. So I would advise them to help them open the road so that they can move on because their thinking process, their ability to change is much, much better than the ability of the previous or other generations. So you have to recognize it as quickly as possible. Thank you very much. I, I, I think you all agree with me. Uh, so there's a lot of hope in the, in the uh, young generation. I would say there's also a lot of hope in creative people in the old generation. Look at Professor Yunus. Um, we, we, the key, the key, the key is adaptability, values, um, accepting change, trying to, to create constructive solutions and solutions which are more responsive 
to the needs of the world, of our human uh, society. Ladies and gentlemen, we have come to the end of the annual meeting 2012. I would like to thank everybody here in the room. Uh, I think we all long now for some sun. I don't know whether there's sun outside to go uh, up to the mountains. But I would like to, to use this opportunity and to thank very much, to thank all those people who were um, many more than 1,000 people who were engaged to make your life here um, productive, comfortable, um, people in the security, people in the operations, people in the technological system. Um, I don't want to single out anybody, uh, but I will make an exception. I think we should all give a hand to... Um, Lee Howell, Lee, are you in the room? If yes, come please, come here. <laughs> Lee. Lee was a person uh, who is responsible for the whole program. And um, Sean Lou and Denis, are you also here? No, say. They were okay behind the scenes, they were also two key operational people. But as I mentioned, there are so many people who have been engaged. And, uh, uh, but you were marvelous participants. Thank you, and I see you all in 2013.